Institute for Mathematics and its application at the University of Minnesota. Um, thank you for coming to the IMA public lecture. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Lang, one of the foremost origami artists in the world. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about his background. Uh, he, Robert studied at Caltech, Stanford, and he received his PhD in applied physics from Caltech. He worked at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab and then later at JDS Uniface, uh, which is a major communications company. Uh, he's author of about uh, 80 publications in optics and optoelectronics, and he holds 46 patents in this field. Um, he's um, an authority in these fields and is an editor-in-chief of, which is a very big job, for a journal called Journal of Quantum Electronics. Uh, this is a major scientific publication that's read by physicists and uh, engineers and mathematicians. In 2001, he decided to devote full time to origami. Over 500 of his work have been cataloged and diagrammed. His work, have been sh has been, his work has been shown in places like the New York Museum of Modern Art, the Nippon Museum of Origami in Kaga, Japan. In 1992, he became the first Westerner ever invited to address the Nippon Origami Association's annual meeting. He lectures widely on origami, its connection to mathematics, science, and technology, and teaches workshops on both artistic techniques and applications of folding to industrial designs. He has consulted on applications of origami to engineering problems ranging from airbag design to expandable space telescopes. He's author and co-author of nine books and numerous articles on origami and art and design, and I saw some people with his books. If you want to have his, his your book, copy of your book autographed, come down after the lecture. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Robert Lang. Thank you, Fadil. Thank you, everyone. From flapping birds to space telescopes, that's it's kind of a crazy title. I mean, you're probably sitting there thinking, what could those two things have to do with one another? They seem very different, but there is a connection, and that connection comes through origami. And so I hope over the course of the next 40 or 50 minutes to establish that connection for you and kind of stop at some interesting places along the way. But let's get started, and let's start with the easy part. What, do we, what is origami? Well. It's this. It's toys. Simple things. The things you learned to fold in grade school. A flapping bird, a blow-up bunny, the cootie catcher. That is all origami. So everyone here has probably done some form of origami. It's an art that comes from folded paper, and it's been around for a really long time. This is a woodcut I found from 1797. These women are... Um, are folding these little strings of figures, and there's a little one there and a few. And if you zoom in, it's this figure right here. This is the traditional Japanese crane, or tsuru. Every Japanese person learns to fold this in kindergarten. And they've been folding it the same way since at least 1797. In fact, probably for somewhat longer than that. This is another image uh, for 1734 from Japan, and it shows here's the crane, and there's a, a boat and a little man and a cube and so forth. And so we fold these same things again. This boat, everyone folds a little boat, sails it down the stream. So once again, been folding the same thing for a really long time, not much change. In fact, we don't know how old origami is. The oldest reference to unmistakable folded representational things from paper comes from about the 1600s, and it talks about two butterflies called Ocho and Micho, and this is an image of what they look like. It's a little stylized, but they're supposed to be butterflies. But the fact is we don't really know when origami began because there are no records of the founding of origami. But it's certainly been around hundreds of years. Now, what are the rules of origami? You've probably heard, or you may have heard, that everything is made from a single uncut square. Japanese term for that is fusetsu sehoke ichimai ori. But in fact, those are mo fairly modern rules. Ancient Japanese origami was usually folded, but sometimes they used cuts, sometimes they used odd shapes. This is an another old image that shows if you take a sheet of paper and you cut slits in it, like this, so you've definitely got cuts, then you can fold this whole thing into the little chain of connected cranes. 
And people still fold these chains of connected cranes even today. So here you go. You can only fold, at the most make a few slits. It's been around for hundreds of years. You would think with such restrictive rules and such a long time for people to play with the idea that a long time ago people would have figured out everything that could possibly be done. And so it would today be a static dead art. And that might have been an accurate description of the field up until the middle of about the 20th century. And for that, we can blame this man. Akira Yoshizawa, widely regarded as the greatest origami artist ever, he took up his country's folk art in the middle of the 20th century and began creating new figures, figures like this, figures of incredible life and beauty and, and emotion. But he did something even more important. He created a language. Specifically, he created this system of dash lines and arrows and dotted lines which convey how to create an origami object. And this is one of Yoshizawa's designs, a little chick. And what this language did is it allowed people to communicate to each other. Because one person could come up with a design and then communicate it to someone else who could learn that, build on top of that, come up with something new, teach it back to the first person. And this ability to communicate and to share ideas launched an exponential growth in the world of origami. A, a renaissance that continues growing to this very day. And it took origami from that simple toy, childlike pastime to something very, very different. Something more like this. So, so this too is origami. This is one uncut sheet of paper. But it takes about five hours to fold. It's one of my designs from about 20 years ago. And it's, it's not a chick or a blow-up box. It's a black forest cuckoo clock. And I just want to point out it's got leaves. It's got a deer's head. It's got a bird. It's got pine cone weights, a pendulum. And it tells the correct time of day twice a day. <laughs> but modern origami is more than just clocks. It's that modern origami is lifelike, it's organic, it's detailed if we want it to be. So, so if we say, well, I want horns and ears and a beard, we can put those in. This even has cloven hooves. And modern origami can take in abstract shapes and even shapes that only the mathematicians in the audience would really ever want to fold. <laughs> and, and so bottles and, and ibexes and clocks and thousands of other origami designs, when you see them all, it, it brings a question to your mind, and that question is, what changed? What really led to this change? How did that language affect the course of origami? And I like to be a little provocative when I give this talk, depending on my audience. In my answer, what changed was math. And my artist friends, when they hear this, they get a little upset because they say, well, I'm an artist, I'm not a mathematician, what do you, I do origami, what do you mean math? And what I mean is that both artists and mathematicians began applying mathematical principles to origami. And that was what made all the difference. Now, the fields of math that touch on origami are very diverse. There's simple math, there's the kind of math you learn in, in high school, like a geometry and trigonometry. There's pretty advanced math, things that people hear at the IMA study, like group theory and computational complexity and everything in between. And the math in, within origami can cover that whole span of difficulty. But the basic rules of origami design are actually really simple. How simple? Well, we'll learn about them in the course of this talk. How does math enter origami? It affects what you can fold. It affects the design of an origami figure. So that's what I want to talk about. What is an origami figure?